All right, class. I know I've done two previous videos on uh, the Soviet Union, and this is the third. It's about what happens after the Civil War um, and how we get to Joseph Stalin as the leader. So let's start with a recap. These slides were on the last video. Um, the Reds win the Civil War. Um, that's by mostly giving food to soldiers and um, vowing to give land to peasants. Um, and their success uh, ends up putting them in a position to start a new country and a new form of government. So how do they do that? Well, they have to consolidate power first, and they bring all the members of the army into the state apparatus, whether as members of the government or, or they give them land. Um, and so the goal is to nationalize land and employ workers. And then, of course, the most important thing is let's fix the economy, which has been ravaged by two wars, both World War I and then the Civil War. The leader of this is going to be Vladimir Lenin. Um, and he and a couple other members of the Bolshevik party become the leading figures of this reorganization of the Soviet state. Um, as I write here, he's uh, a Marxist, um, and he's pushing to create a dictatorship of the pro proletariat. For him, that's a stage on the way to um, communism, the way Marx wrote it. So he's in the process of moving the revolution from the bourgeois who led the revolution to the people. Um, and then his right-hand man is, is Trotsky. They, they see eye-to-eye the -eye on this stuff. Um, and the two of them are really the, sort of the leaders of this movement. So here's what Lenin says about the revolution. Um, he says that the feature of the present situation in Russia is that the country is passing from the first stage of revolution, which, owing to its insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletariat, placed power in the hands of the bourgeoisie, to its second stage, which must place power in the hands of the proletariat. So obviously that's his goal, to get this from a bourgeoisie movement to a proletariat movement. How does he do that? Well, two ways, economically and politically. Let's start with economically. Um, economically, he sets up a, a what he calls the NEP, or the New Economic Policy. Uh, and you can read the slide, but more or less, it's a version of capitalism. It's a small step towards what he eventually wants, which is um, communism. But he's very pragmatic, which means he's practical. So he allows peasants to sell goods on a free market. Um, he doesn't necessarily nationalize all industry. Still, we're 100% worried about currency um, and taxes. You know, so it's very capitalistic. And as I write at the bottom, it, he's afraid to go too far too fast. He's very careful um, and pragmatic. Now, politically, um, how does how do we try to make sure we have a one-party state? Well, in 1921, um, at one of the party congresses. They draft this resolution called On Party Unity. Um, and essentially what it means is that there can, can be no other political parties in the Soviet Union. It's a one-party state. And so eventually what can happen is that um, the Congress and the, and the government and essentially their, their police force um, can disband anything that's not part of the Communist Party or not sanctioned by the Communist Party. Um, and as I say, say here in this slide, you know, Lenin's not super interested in using this to eliminate political opposition. Um, but later on, that, that, is, that is how this can be interpreted, and this is how this can be used, um, and that does happen. So that combined with this, which is a, a group called the Cheka, and they were essentially a secret police force that started as early as 1917. Their job is to combat counter-revolution or sabotage. So their job is essentially this, to ensure that people are doing what the party wants them to do, um, and not working against it. So between that and on-party unity, um, you see that there is an active effort by the Soviets to make sure that people are doing what they want, um, and if they're not, they're going to jail. Um, so as they write at the bottom, and that's from 1922 on, from on-party unity in the Cheka, the communists can eliminate anyone else, um, and Stalin's going to use this frequently. So who's Stalin? Um, He's you know, an active Bolshevik, as I say, in the 1917 revolution. He had been exiled before that and comes back to, to Russia, as many of them did um, during the Civil War, and, and leads and then ends up as, a, as the, quote, general secretary of the Soviet Union. And that's a really important position. It's really high up. And he gets to choose who gets which jobs. Um, so this gives him tremendous political power, and he uses it very, very well. Um, so how does he gain power going from general secretary to, to being the leader of the Soviet Union? Well, Lenin, um, his health fades, and he writes a letter um, trying to sort of set up a, a triumvirate of sorts um, to, for people to share power when he passes away. Um, but it just doesn't go that way. That letter is called Lenin's Testament, 
and it's not necessarily released or, or acted upon, but uh, it, it, it does exist. And so we do know that Lenin had no intention of, of allowing uh, Stalin to take power by himself. And in fact, he's very w weary, of, weary of, of Stalin and what he might do in that position of general secretary. Um, so Lenin's trying to give more power to Trotsky and sort of place Trotsky above Stalin. Um, as, as I said, he and Trotsky see eye to eye, and, and he's very uh, concerned about what Stalin might do. So in the end, um, Lenin, his legacy uh, is one of, as I write here, uh, pragmatic Marxism. Um, he has things that aren't entirely Marxist or, or communist, um, but that's his goal. That's where he's trying to get there. Um, that's where he's trying to get. And so then the second part of the slide is, well, Stalin takes up some of the stuff that Lenin did um, and actually goes his own direction in terms of how he views communist uh, the communist state to, to work both economically and politically. Um, and these the two of them have very different interests. So what does Stalin want? Well, first he has to eliminate the other Bolshevik leaders who are sort of vying for power when Lenin passes away, and all of them want to see the direction of the Soviet party go their way. So what does he do? Well, he attacks um, to, uh, well, he, he, he distances himself from Trotsky on a single issue about whether or not um, there should be socialism in one country, or so just in Russia, or if this is a worldwide movement. Um, and Stalin is much more nationalistic than Trotsky, and he says, no, this is, this is going to happen here, um, and we don't care what's going on elsewhere, whereas Trotsky thinks that this, what's going on in Russia is going to happen across the world. Um, and Stalin ends up winning this fight at the next party congress, where they kind of say, okay, socialism in one country, that's good enough, that's where we want to be. Um, and then so Stalin paints Trotsky as like this traitor who's trying to, who's a, who doesn't like Russia and wants this to be a worldwide movement. It's, you know, it can't happen. Um, and he eventually gets exiled and, Stalin, and Trotsky ends up in, in Mexico, actually. Um, so that's how Stalin distances himself from Trotsky. And then he distances himself from other leaders on economic policy, which is he despises Lenin's new economic policy and he creates his own economics, which he calls five-year plans. Um, and unlike Lenin, who's pragmatic and wants it to take time to get to the communist state of an uh, economic state, um, he wants to do it right away. So he wants to nationalize all the land. He wants to nationalize all industries. Um, he wants to put people to work in those uh, different different industries based on uh, loyalty to the party, um, and so that the government owns and controls everything, all of the means of production. Um, and as I write here, this is a very drastic economic policy. Lenin, as I said, wanted it to take time. Stalin doesn't care about that. And so there's fear that with such a drastic policy that this could create um, drastic political change as well. So those people who disagree, I would call the revolutionary vanguard or the old Bolsheviks. Plenty of them are like, this is too much. This is too crazy. We need to take our time, the way Lenin and Trotsky were saying. Um, and so they get worried. And so Stalin starts to eliminate them one by one. Um, so as I, I explained how he sort of distanced himself from Trotsky and got Trotsky exiled. Um, and at this, at this time when people start to, after they see his five-year plan and he starts putting his, pushing his economic agenda and they start to distance themselves from him or, or attack him a little bit, um, he just continues to find ways to eliminate the opposition. So as I write in this slide, um, uh, Zinoviev and Kamenev, who are two famous, um, Soviet or old Bolsheviks, um, are against the ec economic policy of Stalin um, and are worried about the bread shortages in the Soviet Union. Um, and Stalin just says, no, this is because we're not doing it fast enough. So he blames it on the landed bureaucracy or the kulaks. He says, we need to nationalize land quicker. Um, and so then he continues to try to break up any parties that he sees um, within Moscow. How does he do that? Well, he um, murders his opposition sometimes, even his number two, um, who worked in Leningrad for him, um, when he disagrees with uh, Stalin's economic policy regarding nationalizing land and killing the kulaks. Um, and Stalin says, oh, you know, you know, who did this? How could you do this? And he blames it on other people. Another way to, to eliminate people who disagreed was to use the NKVD, which is sort of an offshoot of the Cheka, which is a secret police force. Um, and they create these troikas, or these three-man tribunals that choose what to do um, that essentially like carry out justice, if you can call it that, um, and often executing people who don't do what the party wants them to do. And this famously happened to the Kulaks who tried to hold on to their land um, and didn't want to allow Stalin to nationalize it. And these troikas would show up at their doorstep and hold these trials and often sentence them to death. 
Here's another example. It's kind of a fun one of uh, the old leader of the NKVD who's carrying out these purges of the people who disagree with Stalin's policy. He himself actually gets purged um, and then he gets tortured and confesses to some crime he didn't commit and then killed. Um, and he gets the nickname the Vanishing Commissar because, as you can see, he conveniently gets photoshopped out of all of his pictures with Stalin because, well, now Stalin disagrees with him. So if you're not getting shot by um, the NKVD or the, these secret police agencies, um, you could also be sent to the gulags. And gulags were these forced labor camps that were set up by the, the Soviet Congress. Um, and gulag was an acronym for the agency that carried this out. And as you can see in the map, um, they're all over the place. Um, and this was a way to eliminate people's enemies, eliminate um, people who don't, who don't do what the party asked them to do or whatever, uh, or, or are in opposition to the Communist Party. Um, Okay, now finally, how does he get rid of some other some of the other leaders, um, like the ones I was mentioning earlier? Well, he creates these, um, or he he hosts these show trials where he has people, much like uh, as I was talking about earlier, um, people tortured and confess to things that they don't commit, crimes they didn't commit, um, and then get killed. Um, and so some of the other leaders you see from the old Bolshevik party, like Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Bukharin. Um, are all executed as part of these show trials. And as, as I read in the slide, they, these were filmed and, and shown around the country and, and then by extension years later around the world. Um, and this is just like, so for example, when Zinov when Kamenev and Zinoviev disagree with uh, Stalin's economic policy, he tries to sort of make them take a back seat in the changes that are going on in the country. And they sort of fall out of favor with the party. Um, and so in the same way that he used socialism in one country to get rid of Trotsky, he uses his economic policy to say, either you're with me and nationalizing the land right away, nationalizing industry and moving quickly to this one-party state and Soviet ec economic policy, uh, or else you're against me. And if you're against me, I'll find a way to, I'll find some charges to bring you in on and um, force you to, to confess in, in front of live television and then kill you. Um, the bottom video I'll play in class, but it's Trotsky's take on this, and he's obviously very, very angry about these show trials, and he calls it what it is, which is, you know, forced confessions and awful murder. Um, and then that, that murder continues as part of these great purges that I mentioned earlier that the NKVD carried out. Here are some statistics on uh, how many people were, were purged who disagreed with this policy. Um, and I've, I've given a bunch of examples with everyone from um, some of Stalin's closest uh, allies who, who then spoke out publicly against him, who got purged, um, people who worked in the government. And I talked about the kulaks or the people who owned land who didn't want to give it up when Stalin was nationalizing land. And so here's an interesting graphic on, on um, what, what the old Central Committee of the Communist Party in 1917 looked like and how they all passed away. Um, and you see many of them, the red ones, uh, shot or died in prison, um, were just killed over time. And there's Stalin um, in the top middle. Uh, who was the leader of all of all of this? So in 1936, the, the USSR creates a, a new a new constitution, right? And it's supposedly the most democratic in the world with direct elections and people voting. Um, but a, as you can imagine, it's still incredibly rep repressive, especially based on what I'm talking about with gulags and these show trials and purges and all that. Um, so between the 30s and late 30s, early 40s. Uh, um, Stalin ends up becoming hugely popular. You kind of had to love him or else, you know, you who, who knows what would happen to you if you opposed him. Um, and so he creates this sort of cult of personality where people um, attribute all the successes of the Soviet Union to him. Um, and they genuinely like him. And the elite, which is now an elite of people that he kind of handpicks, um, because if you're against them, he gets rid of you, um, support him. Um, and in the end, what, what I write at the end of this slide is that that ends up looking a lot like a bureaucracy. This is a group of people who um, are very much ordered by hierarchy in government, and the government controls everything. And so here's another photo of, of Stalin, the propagandist, and the good politician making himself look good, right? Um, and so here's a finally, here's a summary. Um, you could pause it here um, and see sort of a timeline of, of what I just talked about. 